Then you also have the she, and the she, S-I-D-H-E, are human size. So they're usually like five and a half to six and a half foot tall. They are viewed as like basically living in a parallel realm to us on the earth. And they're often viewed as being essentially our cousins, that humans and the she originally were the same race. And a long, long time ago, we're talking about like, you know, Atlantis, Lemuria, you know, way back that they got, we split off. We went more into physical matter and the physical bodies. They stayed more in subtle bodies and subtle matter. Welcome back. I'm here with Dr. Sean Acebjorn Hargens. Sean, welcome back. Yeah, good to be back. Excited to dive in and keep exploring all these crazy topics. Yeah, and this one, I've been intrigued with it, but because it's, I don't, I don't want to say the least evidence. I would say, at least in my experience, it's talked about the least often, right? So like, in my experience, that's probably, I mean, I'm not saying that's true for everybody, but people talk about cryptids all the time. People talk about UAPs and then paranormal, all that stuff. But the Fae, not so much. So based on your research, experiences, interviews with experiencers, what are the Fae? Where can people learn about them? How much serious scientific study has there been regarding their existence, et cetera, et cetera? I asked you a very simple, like straightforward yeah. question. With, you know, probably hundreds of years of research involved, but, you know, yeah. let's start there. Yeah, great. And I'll share some things that I mentioned in the other episode, just so that if folks haven't watched that one, that they don't have to try and figure out what I'm saying. So one thing that's very interesting to me is there's a lot of literature around fairy beings and encounters with and experiences of fairy beings, as much uh, as there is in the UFO, alien, extraterrestrial context, right? So there's not as much around interactions with angels, which mm -hmm. is interesting. Um, but when you're looking at interactions with ETs, there's a lot of material. When you're looking at interactions with fairy beings, there's a lot of material. There might be more material with aliens just because it's a little more, like you pointed out, it's a little more popular. It's a little more you know, safe. Even though there's a major taboo around talking about aliens and ETs, there's more of a taboo talking about fairies, you know? and, right, and, right. Another... And, and, I, and I think the reason primarily is, you know, you didn't have kind of mainstream articles about the Fae in the New right. York Times like you did. Right. With... And the other thing, too, is we are at a technological level of development that we keep finding more and more exoplanets. Right. It's much more likely or statistically likely that there is life on other worlds and much less statistically likely that we would be the only form of life in the universe. So I think it's more resonant with where scientific theory is going and it's more materialist. It has more of a materialist component, at least perceived component than the Fae might. But Anyway, that's just yeah. my opinion. Oh, you make a great point. And I think, you know, as I mentioned before, my kind of shooting from the hip estimation is that about 20 or 30 percent of the UFO phenomena is actually biological and physical. But to your point, the general public sees it as being like 80 or 90 percent physical. Right. You know? And Correct. so the ET hypothesis kind of reigns the day. There's a little room for the interdimensional or ultra terrestrial hypothesis, but it's more kind of like a sideshow. But when you really look at what Lou Elizondo and Chris Mellon and others are saying, they're saying it's not ETH, right? They're saying it's, it's something other than ET in the traditional sense. Like they're saying it's either ultra terrestrial or crypto terrestrial or, but anyways, but you're right. There's a way in which it fits our kind of scientific paradigm because we can imagine that there are physical beings on other physical planets and that right. somehow they've managed to get here. When the United States and China clash, the world will never be the same, especially when forces beyond reality threaten to intervene. What if the United States went to war with the People's Republic of China? How would these rivals fight for supremacy on land, sea, air, and across the stochastic streams of time? 
What wonder weapons would be unleashed? What horrors would emerge from the irradiated sludge of the South China Sea? What heroes would rise and forever change the course of history? Tread into the deepest and darkest dimensions of the multiverse, gaze through a kaleidoscope of fractured realities, and bear witness to the disturbing visions of World War III from today's greatest minds in science fiction, fantasy, and horror. Weird World War, China. Available now from Bain Books at Bain.com. When it comes to the Fae, there's really no example of the, the Fae having a physical component. They sometimes leave physical evidence in the sense that through their subtle bodies and energies, they sometimes can interface with the physical world or interact with the physical world. And so there can be kind of like trace evidence, so to speak, but you you don't have stories of dead fey bodies on ice and you know at, right you know right Patterson air force base <laughs> you know, it's like and then i think also i think we we associate et with like space and the future and the galaxy whereas we associate the fairy with the medieval time and it's yesteryear and it's mythic and it's old and we don't think like that anymore and so you kind of have that going on as well my interest, as I mentioned a little bit in the other episode, into the whole ET and exoterrestrial reality, really emerged out of going doing a deep dive into the fairy realms and having encounters with different types of fairy beings and studying the traditions of, of fairy, working with fairies. And there's not a lot of scientific evidence, like in the way there is scientific evidence for a lot of the UFO and UAP phenomenon. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's also an, an issue. There is a lot of esoteric evidence. So if we're talking about hard science evidence, no. If we're talking about repeatable, like empirical evidence in a broad empirical sense of like, you can do a practice, you can get data, and you can confirm that data with other mm -hmm. people who are trained to do that, right? So in terms of looking at the esoteric traditions, looking at the religious traditions, there's a lot of corroborative and confirming evidence about who these beings are, the nature of these beings, what kinds of beings are there? Can you take it to the scientific bank? No, but but that's not to say there isn't a lot of evidence for them, right? It's a different kind of evidence, right? Because mm -hmm. it's like the you know, evidence like for quality. for economics, right? Like you look at like macroeconomics. You look at it's more social scientific evidence where you look at a broad number of, in your case, maybe accounts where there's yeah. something that's commonly repeated in those accounts about a certain type of behavior. You, you kind of extrapolate across thousands of different accounts. So there's stuff that maybe is not public that is just often repeated. There's maybe some sort of trace physical evidence that could otherwise be natural, but it's just associated with, and a lot of this, I'm just kind of making up the spot. So stop me if yeah, I start no, going off the ranch. Yeah. But maybe so-called fairy rings, I think, is like a physical right. a manifestation right. of whatever this is. So I think what you're trying to say, it's more akin to a discipline like anthropology or economics, like a social science or psychology than it is like quantum mechanics, right? Yeah, it, it, yeah exactly. Okay, anyway, let's continue. I didn't yeah. want to. And so I was having these experiences of both kind of fairy beings and galactic beings and I found that very confusing because, you know, as I mentioned in the last episode, when I'd go to my practitioners working with the fairy traditions, they didn't want to talk about ETs. And when I would go to my colleagues that were exploring the whole UFO phenomena, they didn't want to talk about fairies. Or if they did, they just kind of took the page out of the Lay's playbook and just kind of assumed that those fairy beings are just was a misinterpretation of alien encounters, right? Right. And so you see this dynamic where some people will reduce aliens to fairies and fairies to aliens. And where I arrived is like, they both exist and they kind of annoyingly often look similar to each other, which leads to these reductions in each direction. And so I ended up reading this book called Meet the Hybrids. And it interviews like eight people who identify as being hybrids with different ET races and several of the authors that are being interviewed for their chapters talk about their ability to see and interact with ETs or extra dimensionals, and then also their ability and experience of interacting with different types of nature spirits and elemental beings. 
And so this was a big moment for me because all of a sudden here were a few people who were experiencing both types of beings. And before, I only interacted with people who experienced one or the other. To advertise on Through a Glass Darkly, email throughglassdarkly ads at gmail.com. So I reached out to these people, Jacqueline Smith and Vanessa Lamort, and had conversations with them to understand their experience of both types of beings and to better understand my own experience with both types of beings. And it basically just helped me realize that, yeah, actually, both kinds of beings exist and have to be careful not to reduce them to each other. So one way that I summarize this is that there are fairies and there are ETs or EDs, and for with ED, I mean extra dimensional. There are some fairies are viewed as ETs or EDs. Some ETs and EDs are viewed as fairies. Some fairies look like ETs and EDs. Some ETs and EDs look like fairies. Some ETs and EDs and fairies might actually be something else entirely. Mm -hmm. And then there's Bigfoot, right, who is actually viewed by some as a fairy and by others as an ET or an extra dimensional. And it only gets more interesting the more we explore in that there are actually galactic fairies, fairy and elven beings that live on other planets, some of whom are spacefaring. And then there are intraterrestrials, ETs and EDs that live here inside the Earth or like in another dimension overlaid on ours that in many ways come across as fairy-like or token-esque. And then some abductions are fairies making contact with us during sleep. And some abductions are ETs abducting us during sleep, right? So it's just gets wild. It's just like, there, it kind of is going all over the place. It's very messy. And then to your point, you know, as we were wrapping up, or maybe it was like in the middle of our last conversation, you know, I was talking about the galactic humans, and I gave two possibilities, and then you gave three others, which was wonderful. I'm going to read this quote from this book, Conversations with the She, and I'll talk more about what the She are, but it just really, it kind of underscores this point. He's talking about how fairy beings can show up and present as many other kinds of beings and that you don't necessarily always know what you're dealing with. He says, he is David Spangler. They mimic humanity and they also mimic our people and the she, right? The she is a particular class of fairies. This can blur the lines between fairy, she, and humanity. There are also fairy beings and subtle beings as well that inhabit thought forms created by humanity. So if you encounter a tall elven being with pointed ears and a bow, are you encountering a fairy, a she, or a humanly engendered thought form animated by human collective energies, or perhaps a subtle being, or even one of the fairy races, right? So he's outlining five different possibilities. You have an encounter with what you perceive as a tall elven being with a bow. It could be one of five different things. And, and this is true for ghosts. This is true for ET. Like, there's always this complex interpretive process of like, what are you really dealing with? So, in terms of the fairy beings and kind of like the categories of fairy beings, there's five or six main ones. The first is the elementals, and these are connected to the four elements: earth, air, fire, and water. And that these are considered to be made out of just the pure energy or essence of each of those elements. That's why they're elementals, because they're made out of only that one element. Fire elementals are only made out of the essence of fire energy. Water elementals are only made out of the essence of water energy, right? And so, in many of the alchemist traditions, they would work with the elementals. They would work, work with these beings and their efforts to try and get the have, philosopher's stone to create gold, you know, and the elixir for Im immortality. Have modern people had encounters with these, yeah. these beings? Yeah. Uh, can yeah. you give a quick example? Like I've never heard I've never heard this to this extent before, right? Well, the way that they often show up is that the earth elementals are often perceived as gnomes, right? So that's a common kind of experience. Though there are fairy beings that look like gnomes that are not elementals too, right? And so, but the earth elementals are often gnomes. The fire elementals are called salamanders. But they're basically, they look like a fire flame. And these terms come from like kind of medieval alchemical mm -hmm. traditions. And then the water elementals are undines, which is basically an old English word, I think, for mermaid. And so they're basically like water nymphs, 
They don't necessarily all have a tail, like a fish tail, like a mermaid, but you can, you know, kind of like you think of like a small mermaid, like being, you know, that would be, and they like live in the lakes and the rivers and water, obviously. And then the air elementals are slifts, um, S-L-Y-P-H-S. And they're more of what we think of as like kind of Tinkerbell, though they don't necessarily have wings. That's the whole wing thing with fairies. The Victorian era added them and then Disney kind of built on that. Some fairies are perceived as having wings, but that seems to be more something we're adding to them in our interpretive enactment of them. And same with angels. You know, generally, most accounts of angels and fairy beings don't have them like first person, clairvoyant, seer like experiences of these beings do not report wings generally, though sometimes. And so the question is, the perception of wings, is that because they're part of their nature? No, it doesn't seem like it. It seems like it's more part of just the symbolism that's emerged in our cultural space that we then bring to the encounter. And so there's the elementals, and they're like mm-hmm. kind of the smallest, and in some ways the most very powerful beings. So when shamans do weather magic, often they're working with you know the air elements, elementals, maybe the fire elementals, water elementals. So they're kind of working at that kind of basic level of manifestation. So then there's the nature spirits. Nature spirits are kind of what we generally think of as like all the little kind of gnomes and fairy beans and sprites and brownies and kind of all the things from our fairy stories talk about basically nature spirits. And they look like little fairy beans and they are described differently in different geographies but they often have similar kind of functions and roles. But it does seem that just like lizards, frogs, and deer in North America are are different than those animals in South America or Australia or Russia, there are different types of fairy beans in different geographies that are unique to those geographies. So you don't have at this level like universal fairy beans that you kind of find everywhere. So like the Mahuhuni in Hawaii are described consistently of looking in a certain way and having certain styles of interacting, right? And those seem particular to those beans. You find some similar description to some kind of dwarf-like beans in South America. But again, it's like just because they look a little different, sometimes they're very different temperaments, very different styles. The fairy beans is where we get a lot of the folklore. So I make a distinction between the descriptions that come from folklore, and these are stories that are passed from family to family, community to community, and then first-person clairvoyant descriptions of people who have psychic abilities to perceive these beans, right? And so when you compare the folklore literature with the experiencer literature, they don't always match up one-to-one. And so you have to account for the folklore adds layers, right? Mm -hmm. Usually a lot of layers and they they tap into archetypal energies and archetypal symbolism. And so these first person clairvoyant experiences get kind of pulled into and layered into a cultural process that then produce the fairy stories that we often think of. So there's often a grain of truth in the fairy stories, but there's often many layers of cultural interpretation that are kind of mixed into the folklore. And so they're not, in a sense, as reliable in terms of telling us about the actual nature of these beings as those people who have clairvoyant experiences of them and interact with them and document those, right? And in the last episode, I mentioned there's this fairy consensus that's done every five years for the last 10 years, and they publish between 400 and 500 first-person accounts of modern-day fairy sightings from around the world. I went to, in my during my master's, when I was finishing my master's and getting ready to do my PhD, I went to Bhutan and lived there for six months. And part of what I wanted to do there was, I was studying environmental studies there, but I also was interested in how they approach nature spirits, because you know, a lot of the shamanic traditions work with them. And Buddhism and Vajrayana as kind of one form of Buddhism in Tibet and Bhutan have kind of incorporated a lot of shamanic elements. So their form of Buddhism actually makes room for kind of all these fey beings. And I was very interested in that because in Christianity, the fey have generally been demonized as of the devil, literally, right? And so, so I was very curious about how Christianity dealt with fairies, basically kicking them out of the faith. 
and how Buddhism dealt with them. And that was basically bringing them in and often making them protector beings of different areas and of different teachings and things. So I found that very interesting that our different religious traditions, kind of how they've navigated interacting with these types of beings. And so there's the elementals, there's the fairy beings uh, or the nature spirits. And then the nature spirits tend to really focus on helping plants and animals grow and develop. So it's elementals and nature spirits, then fairies. And I just was talking a lot about the fairies kind of around the world. Nature mm -hmm. spirits and fairies sometimes are clumped together in the same category and both called fairies or both called nature spirits. When you work with or talk to clairvoyants, they usually will make a distinction between these three categories. The nature spirits have more free will than the elementals, and they have specific jobs and roles of supporting the natural world to grow and develop in particular ways, right? So there will be nature spirits living in trees or around trees or helping plants grow. And so so they're basically like the energetic intelligences that support the life process in the natural world. And then fairy beings have a little more kind of freedom and a wider range of roaming. Nature spirits are usually connected to a particular location or particular they're like the Roman genii loci, something like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then fairies, you know, the, the kind of traditional fairy beings can move around kind of from one valley to another valley kind of thing, or, you know, one area. And the fairies tend to have more activities that look human-like. Nature spirits don't like play games or do, th you know, like, so, but fairy beings often are reported like making music. Nature spirits don't make music so much. Fairy beings do. So fairy beings are kind of like this third class, so like often a little bigger, kind of a little more dynamic. And then you have devas, which are kind of higher order being that kind of oversee like a forest or even sometimes a building or a river or a mountain. And so they kind of help guide and give support to the other three classes, the fairies, the nature spirits, and the elementals. So the Dave is kind of like the CEO, right, of some kind of natural space usually, but sometimes can be like maybe they oversee a, a city park or maybe a church. Like some devas are kind of like urban and some are like kind of natural. And a lot of times the devas are thought of or mistaken for or described as angels, or sometimes they're called earth angels. So here you start to get into a situation where these kinds of fae are sometimes also thought of in terms of the celestial category, right? So a lot of times these beings kind of can be in several different categories. Then you also have the she, and the she, S-I-D-H-E, are human size. So they're usually like five and a half to six and a half foot tall. They are viewed as like basically living in a parallel realm to us on the earth. And they're often viewed as being essentially our cousins, that humans and the she originally were the same race. And a long, long time ago, we're talking about like, you know, Atlantis, Lemuria, you know, way back that they got, we split off. We went more into physical matter and the physical bodies. They stayed more in subtle bodies and subtle matter. And that they, you know, kind of have cities, they have jobs, they have activities that they look like Tolkien's elves. But that's often the result of our own thought forms and them sometimes using those thought forms to present themselves to us. And so there's been kind of a whole like she renaissance in the last 10 years where David Spangler and a number of other authors have been sharing more of their own experiences with the she and talking about them and describing their reality, their civilization, their activities. And so the Irish often talk about the she um, right. as well as these other types of beings. But like, for instance, in the early Irish history and the myths, they talk about that the she arrived in a cloud that landed on a mountaintop, and then they came down from that. So it basically sounds like it could be a UFO, right? right. And the she themselves say that they are stellar beings like us, that we both come from the stars, that we don't come from Gaia herself. Whereas all the other fae, the devas, the fairy beings, the nature spirits, and the elementals, all are kind of described as children of Gaia. And that's why I sometimes refer to them as those are beings that kind of emerged out of our planetary matrix. 
and they're very much connected to this planetary metrics. Other planets have that as well. They have their own nature spirits and elementals, and, and there might even be different elementals. It might not just be the four we have. There might be another category, for instance. So yeah, let me stop there because that, that was a lot. But that's kind of a, a quick cartography of you know some of the main categories of the Fae as represented by both the folklore and first-person clairvoyant experiencers. So the she, is that just an Irish phenomena? I.e., is that just happened in Ireland or have they been observed uh, all yeah, around the world? They are observed around the world. Sometimes the jinn are, are thought of as being like the she, but kind of a different category. And so the jinn come out of the Middle East. The jinn sometimes are viewed in the category of she, or sometimes are viewed in the category of fairies. Fairies are often thought of as being a combination of like water and air, like a couple elements. The mm -hmm. jinn are thought of as being air and fire. So the jinn are thought to be kind of more fiery in nature and they're more trickster. And that's partly what's maybe led to them being viewed more demonically and evil is because they kind of have this fire air energy as part of their makeup. Whereas the fairy beings associated with Ireland and the US, they don't seem to have that. They seem to be more water, air combination. But so the she, there's, an, I think it's the Cherokee. They have a number of myths and legends that talk about basically the she and their descriptions of these human sized fairy beings that live in this other dimension match very closely the Irish description. And then also in Iceland, they have the hidden folk that they talk about. And the hidden folk are another kind of version of the she. They're tall, human-like beings. So you do find descriptions of the she in different parts of the world, and they seem to be describing more or less the same types of human-like beings that share kind of, on some level, common ancestry with us and are more human-like than the other fey beings. And partly because like the she themselves are reporting at least via a few of the clairvoyants who represent them, that they're stellar beings, that they came from the stars like we did. It's kind of like they're like, at the same time, they're like a fey and a human. They're like a fey human. And there are stories of there being people born with fairy blood, and then sometimes she born with human blood. So there seems to be kind of some narratives around hybridization and mixing of DNA and genetics. And it parallels some of what you see in the UFO context. Joshua Churchkin, you know, has written a great book on Thieves in the Night that looks at fairy abductions and alien abductions and the parallels with those kind of different scenarios. And his conclusion is that it's the same phenomenon but he's, he doesn't land on whether it's fairies taking the babies or the kids or the aliens taking the fairies or the kids. But he says, if you really study the descriptions, they match so closely, it appears to be the same phenomenon, whether it's the same type of being or two different types of being that basically have the same protocol, it's hard to tell. But those would be fairies, not the she right? The she don't seem to be involved with any kind of changeling or fairy abduction process. But there are humans that have been able to physically walk into the she realm. And there are some she that apparently have been able to manifest somewhat physically in our realm. The she describe themselves as being physical beings in a physical world. So they say they're not subtle beings, but to us, they appear as subtle beings and we appear as subtle beings to them. So it's like we're two physical beings living in different frequencies that perceive the other as kind of like a subtle being or like what we would call a fairy being. Now, in the very beginning of this interview, you mentioned that some or elements of modern accounts are mentioned in the folklore, and there are other elements of folklore that don't necessarily tend to be true for modern accounts. In terms of some of the folklore, there's this kind of aversion to iron that's sometimes mentioned that there's kind of the changeling phenomena and there's also the instances of time anomalies of those three how often do you see those in modern accounts yeah so the missing time occurs currently and you know and this again highlights the likelihood that we're dealing with a subtle realm phenomenon people moving in and out of a subtle realm because in the subtle realm, also like time dilation and time compression, right. 
Yeah, yeah. So you have all three, missing time, time dilation, and time compression in UFO context and in fair encounter context. The changeling, again, pointing to Joshua's work, it seems to be the same phenomenon, whether it's done by different beings or the same being, it's not clear, but that does seem to be a real phenomena that, and then of course, but then here's like an example of where the folkloric piece gets overlaid on it. So the folkloric piece often, if a child was born with Down syndrome, or in some way was mentally handicapped, or had a physical deformity, then people would claim it was a changeling, and then leave it out in the forest for the wild animals to get for it to die due to exposure to the elements, right? And so you get like a real phenomena of some kind of abduction occurring, but then it gets pulled into a folkloric kind of narrative that's used to justify arguably abhorrent behavior on the behalf of humans who arguably don't know better and that they really believe this and whatever. So there's an example where there's a real dimension to the phenomenon, but then a folkloric layer gets laid over it. So a lot of the folkloric elements are more like superstitious and kind of magical thinking that gets kind of attributed to these beings. Though, like you said, like the time thing is, seems to cut across, the changely thing cuts across, and there was another category you mentioned. Do you remember? Iron. Was? Aversion iron. to iron. Yeah, that one, I'm not remembering. I've read people who have talked about whether that's real or not real in terms of kind of modern day experiences of fairy. I think that's more a folkloric example, but I could be wrong. It might be that. Um, what about like leaving cream out? And yeah, you know, w w or, uh, yeah, there's there's some sort of offering or I know it's a good example. That seems to be a mix where it's like that seems to be more for us. But I think what the fairy beans take from that is like some say that the fairies can come and kind of extract the juju from the milk, like the essence, like the energy of the milk. I'm not sure that that's the case. I think what happens is the fairies see us putting out the milk or the cream. And they see our intention, they experience our intention, our goodwill, and that it's more the act and the gesture that carries the cross. And so that's the real part of it, is that you're showing respect and appreciation, and that does have currency that goes across the realms. Whereas the the way we wrap it up with like, oh, it has to be milk, and it has to be on a Sunday, and it you know it has to be pointing north. I think all of that is like the folkloric kind of layers that are added onto a genuine practice that helps create an authentic connection between these beings and ourselves, right? So I think that's a good example of kind of how the folklore and the clairvoyant piece kind of gets kind of mixed in together. Now, in terms of some of the modern accounts, how do people often experience these beings? Yeah, often they're really freaked out because they can't believe that this is happening. Like, it's almost like a joke. It's kind of like, oh my God, I saw this gnome on my windowsill. Like, it's almost like it'd be easier to believe it was an alien than it was like a, right. a gnome. It, it, yeah, right, you know? be, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and then there's all, almost very often this kind of really doubting yourself. And then usually it's like, the person has maybe a couple experiences in a like a couple day period where they can and to realize, okay, this wasn't just a one-off thing. Like I saw that the little gnome being on the windowsill on Friday, and then something happened on Sunday. And th then my daughter said something that she saw something out in the garden that she thought was a fairy on Tuesday. And so all those things are connected. And so I'm not going crazy, but I have no idea what it is I'm dealing with, right? So there's sometimes they're described in kind of class classical ways, like gnomes with like little red hats. Sometimes they're described as like just a little people. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're described more as, as like a poltergeist or kind of a ghost or like even like a little shadow being. There was this interesting Bigfoot book that I read uh, last year. And this guy was having a number of Bigfoot encounters on his property. This was in Minnesota. And then other people in his family were having them too. So there was a kind of an emerging consensus like, yeah, we really do have one or more Bigfoot on our property. They had a big piece of land mm -hmm. and we are interacting with them. And then they would often be, um, squashers, you know, people hunting Bigfoot and so forth, they will go and they'll put out little gifts like 
little marbles and shiny things as kind of, again, like a token of like trying to peace offering. So they were doing that out in the woods at a particular place and the items were getting moved and new things were being brought and put there that seemed to be gifts back from the Sasquatch. But then they started having this poltergeist activity in their house. And they thought it was the Bigfoot were coming into the house and like messing with things or, and then they had a psychic come because they were like trying everything like, all right, like, hey, you know, my friend knows this woman who's a psychic and, you know, okay, let's bring her over and just see what she says, right? Right, so, just throwing so everything comes, up against the wall and seeing what right, sticks, right? Right, yeah, exactly. So she comes out and she's like checking things out. She's like, oh yeah, okay, here's the portal where the Bigfoot are coming in and out of their dimension. Like, okay, that's what's happening over here. She comes to the house and she's like, no, you don't have any Bigfoot, you know, interacting with the house. You have a bunch of nature spirits or what I think would maybe be more accurately called fairy beans. They've gotten a activated because of the Bigfoot activity on the property it's kind of, it's ramped up there. Like, they're kind of like really like freaking out about it and really kind of like it's it's added a bunch of energy into their space. And so they've come into your house and they're moving stuff around. So it's not a poltergeist in the classic poltergeist sense. It's these nature spirits and fairy beings from around your house that are getting pumped full of energy because of the Bigfoot dynamic stuff. And they're coming into the house and they're messing with your keys and they're messing with this and that. And right. And so, but they never thought of that. They just assumed it was the Bigfoot because they had seen the Bigfoot and had experiences of the Bigfoot. So now they're explaining everything that they're encountering through the Bigfoot lens. Whereas this woman comes and suggests, well, actually, maybe it's this other phenomenon, these other beings that are doing that part of it. Right. When you, you know, said so. they're you said they're moving, they were moving the keys and stuff like that. Yeah, so sometimes like it disappearing and then showing it like a jot, J-O-T-T, just one of those things which refers to like uh, things disappearing like a ring or a key and then showing up in another spot, which is kind of classic poltergeist activity. Or So, so we uh, we talked about movie. Stephen Mira, I think in the right. last episode, there was an incident where they had a mug and it was part of a collection of mugs. So they were virtually identical mugs. And they had a poltergeist experience where the mug disappeared and then reappeared. They did a chemical or a molecular analysis on the oh, mug wow. that reappeared. It looked like the same mug, but it was not the same. Oh, wow. it, was, it had a completely different molecular signature. So it was as if I think his hypothesis, and again, I don't want to steer too far afield, but I think his hypothesis is that it's some kind of like a quantum anchor where yeah. a poltergeist uses it because what they did is they took this mug and they you know took it someplace else away from the house so yeah. the poltergeist activity started occurring in the new location and eventually the poltergeist or whatever the phenomenon was eventually migrated back to the house mm -hmm. but yeah. there's some other weird thing going on it's like a kind of like a you know for lack of a better word a doppelganger but the yeah. material it looked the same, like and when it yeah. looked almost identical. But when you looked at the actual substance, it was not the same. Anyway, I didn't mean right. to take you off track. No, so no, exactly. when they're saying keys missing and reappearing and kind of the the uh, kind of these beings are reacting to the energy of the cryptids. Yeah, it's also it's like the poltergeist phenomena too is interesting because the classic view was you have a disgruntled prepubescent female in the house and she has all this pent up emotional energy for different reasons and that that creates a psychic kinetic capacity for her to move things yeah. and that creates fear and then the fear opens up kind of a uh, interdimensional door where then negative entities or even ghosts from connected to that property kind of start showing up so now you have ghosts like three or four different ghosts connected to the house or kind of part of the situation and then that freaks people out more and then you get negative entities going, oh, look, like there's some good fear going on down there. Let's go check it out. So then you get authentically negative beings coming in and amping up the fear factor, right? And so then you have someone come in and say, oh, it's just this girl and she's just pissed off about something. And once we take care of her, this will all disappear. Sometimes that is a big part of it. But it kind of reduces all the other phenomena to just her emotional psychic capacity, right? And it's mm -hmm. kind of like often these phenomena, 
at Skinwalker Ranch, you have this all the time. You know, it's like you get the Bigfoot, the ETs, the fairy beans, the ghosts, the poltergeist. It's just like it just becomes a paranormal shit show, right? You know, we're just like mm -hmm. all this stuff is happening, right? And then we tend to try and just put it in one box, like, oh, it's all the girl, or oh, it's all the poltergeist. The bows, uh, no, right, right. no, it's just the Bigfoot, right? All right. It seems that this phenomena, because there's quantum dimensions, there's subtle dimensions, there's consciousness dimensions, that you know, it's kind of like bees to honey. Once there's a pot of honey out right? Whether it's fear or like a mug that's like kind of a quantum anchor or any number of things. It's kind of like beans from all these different domains are kind of like, oh, let's go check that out, right? And then it's like, and we and because we have a very anemic cosmology, right? We don't have a very rich view of multiple types of beans inhabiting the world around us. Then it's, it's all a ghost or it's all this or it's all that. Like, we don't have the sense of going, oh, well, this part of it might be a ghost and this part might be the nature spirits coming in from outside because they're kind of gotten all excited or maybe Bigfoot's involved. Once we go there, it just sounds so effing crazy. Like we just kind of shut it down. We're just like, nope, like this is too much. <laughs> it's like Pandora's paranormal box is open. Yeah, it's almost like you have to take it one step at a time and Right. <laughs> try to categorize but uh, as you mentioned though, like, so much of it yeah so much of it overlaps and the other issue too is where i think your expertise uh, comes in extremely handy is that most people are looking at this through the lens of one discipline right so you have quantum physicists looking at it they're looking at the double slit experiment right everything is kind of an equation everything is waves which is probably part of this there's probably yeah. some wave component, vibrational frequency, and then you end up shifting into, you know, it just might just be the degree at which the atoms in your body are vibrating, right? Maybe that's kind of like switching a frequency on a radio station. So are these things dangerous? When I say things, I mean kind of fairies, the fae, or anything like that. The folklore definitely is very clear on that point, that... They're dangerous, but more that they're tricksters and they can kind of mess with your day, right? When you get into the abduction stuff, then that does feel more kind of dangerous of like there's something there that could be more sinister or more kind of understandably viewed in a very negative light. Fairy beans, unlike, don't seem to be negative. Like I really don't. I mean, sometimes there are fairy beans that are angry at humans or because they're for different reasons and probably for good reasons. So they're not evil or mean, but like they're mad and like they'll mess with you. So like if you're walking through the forest and one of those is there, like they might create fear in you by like giving you this ominous presence that you feel and you're just like, ew, I, let's get out of here. You know, like, like so that could be a, a nature spirit or a fairy being being like kind of like, oh, these damn humans. Like I'm going to use my capacities to kind of like put the fear of God a fear of fairy into them. I've really not come across descriptions of people being harmed or hurt or really negative things happening to people, people getting scared, interacting with kind of angry beings for sure. In contrast to the UFO phenomenon where you do have a lot more sinister stuff going on, right? The abductions in that context seem to be much more against your free will and problematic you have reptilians, you have the UFOs in Brazil in the 70s that were shooting laser beams at people and hurting them. You have a lot more, more examples and stories of some people who have been dying from radiation exposure. You know, like, so if anything, UFOs and ETs seem to be much more dangerous than fairy beans. And that partly is probably because fairy beans, as we talked about before, are almost exclusively subtle realm phenomenon. They don't really have a physical component and they don't seem to have the energy or the capacity to kind of manifest in physical embodied forms, the way some ET beings might do that, but they will report it takes a lot of energy. And so some ET groups seem to be able to move in and out of like an energy mode to a physical mode. And so I think that plays a role with kind of, they can cause more harm. The ETs can cause more harm because they're, they interface with our physical world m more clearly than the Fae do. All right, last question, because I think we're pretty much out of time. Have you had any experiences with these beings? 
I have not in like a clairvoyant sense. Like I always want to have like a visual experience. I have had like in meditations, I've had kind of visionary experiences that have emerged that seem in my interpretation and working with some of my teachers and other people that work in space kind of have led me to interpret them as like those were encounters with different fairy beings and elementals. I've had experiences going into the woods and feeling them like and doing different practices where I can sense them through my body and then through intention and meditation kind of have interactions and then going back to those places and having additional interactions. But like you said, I always have to hold all of this very lightly because there's mm-hmm. cognitive bias, there's cultural interpretations, right? So I, I don't take any one of my experiences as like a definitive bulletproof experience. I'm always second guessing myself. I'm always trying to get input from mentors and teachers. I'm developing my own kind of Gnostic ability to discern and to trust my experience opposed to just my rational mind kind of always playing the what if game, right? Mm. So, but my sense is that over time, right, that I get better at that and I feel more capable of discerning authentic encounters and receiving information but I, I then have to verify it in various ways and, you know, work with it. For me, it's part of the learning has been learning to work in a mode of perceiving and discernment that's very different than rational scientific modes that I've cultivated in the context of my education and work and so forth. So I take it in baby steps, but I do feel confident in saying I have had experiences with elementals, nature spirits. Not so much fairy beings, but the she and devas. So of all the ones we've talked about, fairy beings are probably the ones that I've had the least kinds of clear interactions or encounters with. So yeah, that's a good note to end on. All right, Sean. Yeah, I could probably keep you on another hour or so because I still have tons of questions, but maybe a future episode. So I appreciate your time and this has been very illuminating. Thank you. Great. Yeah, well, thanks for having me on. It's been wonderful to be back on the show and look forward to coming again. And, you know, I mentioned it in the other episode, but I'll just mention it here that in the course that I'm doing starting in April, the first week it's on 10 entity encounters, 10 types of entities that humans encounter in our modern day life. The first week is on fairies and the fae. So we're going to be diving into that in that course. And, And then we look at aliens and angels and demons and ghosts and Bigfoot and lots of other types of beings. So if people are interested in fairies, but also the wide range of entity encounters, just go to exostudies, exostudies.org, and you'll see the drop down for the, the new 10 week course. So great. Thank you, Sean, and have a great rest of your day. Yeah. And folks who want to click on that, it'll be down below in the links. And thank you again, Sean. Talk soon. All right. Cheers. Bye now. If you enjoyed today's video, please hit like and subscribe and also hit the notification button so you can be notified whenever I post new content. Thank you. Now, if you're enjoying the channel and you want to support it, there are several things you can do. In fact, there are five things you can do. The first thing you can do is just buy my books. I got plenty of books out in the market right now, and I would prefer that folks buy a book rather than giving me direct support because they get something out of it. They have a real tangible product. The second way you can support me is by becoming a member on YouTube or becoming a patron on Patreon. And just go to either site and it'll explain everything. third way you can support the channel is by checking out my merch site, which is here. There's plenty of stuff that you can get to support the channel. And I'd appreciate that you, you have it and you can wear it. Not only do you help support the channel, but you also help promote the channel. And I appreciate that. The fourth way that you can support the channel, and this is really easy, is anytime you want to buy something on Amazon, 
literally just go to the description below and click on any link, literally any link. The channel gets a cut of that and it costs you no extra money. You just go through the link as I'm part of the Amazon Affiliates program. The fifth and final way you can support the channel is through donations. Now, I don't prefer these because it's more of a expression of gratitude, but you don't really get anything out of it as a subscriber to the channel. However, if you decide to do these options, there's two options. There's Buy Me A Coffee, which is a separate site. And there's also, you can go through YouTube with either a super chat, a super sticker, or a super thanks. Again, I prefer Buy Me A Coffee because that organization takes less money than Amazon does. But either way, I appreciate any support you, you are willing to give the channel. So thank you very much and keep watching. I really appreciate it.